Matthew 23, beginning at verse 23. We're going to read today simply through verse 28. So we're looking at six verses. Matthew 23, beginning at verse 23 through verse 28. And the King James text today reads in this fashion, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup, and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic Chew your food. Amen. Chew your food. Master, we love you. We thank you, Lord, as always, for every opportunity we have to come into the house of God. The word of the Lord is our lifeline. It is the bread which has come down from heaven to feed your people, to nourish us, to give us what we need to grow and to develop and to mature. Master, the preacher of the gospel is useless unless and until the anointing of the Holy Ghost is applied to their life and to their speech. Anoint today, O oh God, my feeble lips of clay and allow me to deliver unto the people of God a message, a word that will contribute to their growth, their development, their maturity, and most of all, Lord, that will allow their faith to grow and to prosper. Let us not leave this service the same way that we have come in. But let us leave, Lord, changed and challenged by the word of God to reach higher, to step up higher. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many Christians today gag and choke on the most central themes, I'm sorry, on the most nominal themes of the Christian faith. Yet, they get so caught up in trying to interpret and apply the tiniest of details so that they might externally appear righteous and godly, not in the eyes of God, because God, <coughs> the Word of God tells us, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. 
And as Brother Gillum told me so many years ago, it is so much easier to clean up the outside. It is so much easier to create an appearance of righteousness, an appearance of godliness, an appearance of holiness, than it is to aspire to and attain these things inwardly. So, instead of God's people understanding the major themes of the Christian faith, which in turn inform the subtexts, they act as though the subtexts are, as, uh, are of as great an importance as the major themes. You know, anybody who's ever done any writing or public speaking, you know that oftentimes you will uh, create a outline for your uh, whatever it is you're writing or whatever it is uh, the speech you're going to be making. And when you write an outline, you have to break everything down into the most important or the primary themes and then you will have sub themes that fall under those primary themes well unfortunately today believers often bypass the primary themes they don't even work on those things they don't even try in those areas but instead they go way down the list to something that is way down at the bottom of the list and they work on those things because those things are the things that are visible to man. Those things are the things which allow them to appear righteous and godly in the eyes of human observers. But by passing the greater themes, they fail to affect any change in their heart. They fail to affect any change in their lives which would impress our God. Hallelujah. In Matthew 23, 23, the first verse of our primary text today, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. So there are some issues which are of greater importance, which are of greater weight. And those issues Jesus identified as judgment, mercy, and faith. These, he said, ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. What a shame that we can swallow a camel and yet we can gag at the tiniest of details. We are completely incapable of digesting and understanding the bigger things while we work so hard on nibbling on the tiniest little issues. My Lord have mercy. That really don't carry a lot of weight in heaven. Because as I've said, God looks on the heart, whereas man looks on the outward appearance. And therefore the weightier themes are those themes which God is concerned with. Those are the things that are part of our inward makeup. They define who we are. They define how we conduct ourselves. If you understand that one of the primary themes of the Christian faith, of course, is love. When you understand that God, above all else, 
has called his people to love and not merely to love those who love us in return. Jesus said even the heathen does that. Mm -hmm. You're not impressing anybody by loving those who love you because you can go into the church house and hug everybody's neck and love on everybody in your little fellowship or in your little sanctuary. Honey, that means nothing. It's when you can love the dirtiest and vile of unbelievers in the middle of Kroger that you have something that God minds and God pays attention to. Some years ago, one of the greatest pastor's wives that I've ever known in my life, Sister Wanda Davis, she was the United Pentecostal uh, preacher's pastor, Brother Davis's wife. That lady was amazing. I you would have had to have known her to know what I'm talking about. There was a spirit that emanated from her. The first day I met her, I, immediately you just sensed it. There was a loving, compassionate spirit that just emanated from her, like Sister Gillum and Brother Gillum, you know. And Sister Davis just had the most loving spirit, and it wasn't it's not about, you know, some people try to put on that, oh, I'm so loving act, you know. And, and you can tell oftentimes when someone is disingenuous and they're really not real about it, you know. Sister Davis wasn't like that. The United Pentecostal Church of the Holiness Movement, for that matter, tends to be very, very stoic and very um, rules oriented women don't hug on men and men don't hug on women in holiness circles and that's fine so sister davis didn't have to hug on me she didn't have to you know physically hug me and hold me to demonstrate love there was just something in her that just emanated from her and when Sister Davis died, someone I've known for many years associated with the church that she and Brother Davis pastored, uh, he had married a young girl who was Baptist. <clears throat> and this lady that this man I know married, uh, she and I became friends on Facebook and we were communicating on Facebook and she let me know that Sister Davis had passed away. And I told her, I said, you, you have no idea how heavy that makes my heart. You have no idea how broken that leaves me. I said, Sister Davis was one of the most amazing Christian ladies, Holy Ghost filled tongue-talking, Jesus-name-baptized women that I've ever known in my life. If anybody lived this apostolic faith the way it ought to be lived, it was Sister Davis. And this young lady said to me, she said, I know, she said, you know, I grew up in the Baptist church and when I married that fella from her, uh, her church, she said, every once in a while I'd bump into her at the grocery store or I'd bump into her at Walmart. She said, and I don't live the way those folks live. She said, I'd have on my tight jeans and my t-shirt and my flip-flops and there was Sister Davis in her long flowing skirt and her long sleeve blouse you know, tidily buttoned right up to the top button with her hair piled on her head. And she said, every time Sister Davis would see me, no matter where it was, she said, I could count on her walking over to me and throwing her arms around me and giving me a big hug and telling me she loved me. She said, that lady was 
amazing. She said there was something about her that you could sense and you could feel across a crowded room. You could feel it. She literally stood out. Even in a crowded space, that lady stood out from the crowd because there was always a smile on her face, never a scowl. You never saw her running around full of anger and angst and negativity. I guarantee you, she would not have been a mega. Because the spirit of Mega would never have meshed with her spirit. She was too busy, listen to me, working on chewing the camels. She was too busy trying to digest the greater themes. The things that were of greater importance and greater weight in the eyes of God. Not in the eyes of men. She was too busy trying to live this thing the way that God would have it lived. So that when people looked at you, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, it was not based upon her outward appearance. It was not based upon her outward conduct. No, it was based upon something that was within her that just shined out like a light. And believe me, sinner and saint alike could see it. Hallelujah. Oh, God help us. God help us to live this thing the way we ought to live it so that our spirit is shining like a light in a dark world. Hallelujah. So that people look our way and they don't say, oh, you know, he always acts nice. He always talks nice. I've said it before and I'll say it again here in Alabama. I must say, the people are incredibly friendly. The people in this state are immensely friendly. I've I don't know that I've ever been anywhere where people were so friendly. But by the same token, while they're very friendly and, you know, I've had some people when we first got here, I had some people tell me, they said, yeah, folks here are friendly. And then they added a little caveat to your face. See, it isn't hard to be nice to people to their face. Mm -hmm. And then when you get out of their company, when you're no longer before them, all of a sudden you begin to voice your criticism. All of a sudden you begin to voice your negativity. All of a sudden you begin to voice your judgment. Oh, but you can put on a good show. By all appearances, you're friendly. But true friendliness, you know, we moved into, I'm sorry, my brain tends to move real quickly. I watch myself preach sometimes and I see how quickly my thought processes move about and I apologize for that. When we first moved into our house here in Alabama, one of our neighbors uh, was out in the yard and we met them and we began to speak to them and they were very friendly and uh, they behaved very friendly and very nice and I was very impressed and I told Tommy, I said, well, they certainly seem to be friendly enough, folks. But you know, in the final analysis, it's not about whether or not they can simply smile at you and act friendly to you when you're talking to them. But are these the kind of people who would happily jump if you needed help? Or who would happily come to your assistance if you needed them? Are these the kind of neighbors who would immediately 
step up and do what was needing to be done in order to help you. See, a lot of those same people are so nice and so sweet and so friendly. That's as far as it goes. Am I telling the truth mm -hmm. today? I like to think, I may be wrong, but I like to think that I'm a better neighbor than that. I, I got into a lot of trouble in Texas being the kind of neighbor that I had grown up believing I ought to be. When I was a young man, I'd go out and mow my father's lawn. He was never happy with the way I mowed it. He never liked the way I did it, he could always find fault with it some kind of way. But after I mowed our lawn, there was one house over and one house back on the next street. There was an older woman who lived there with her son, and her son was probably in his 30s, but he worked an awful lot, and he wasn't home a whole lot. And most of the time, their yard would get kind of high and unruly. So I began to take our riding mower, our Sears Craftsman riding mower, up the road to the Koch's house, and I would uh, mow their lawn. And Mrs. Koch, bless her heart, she was an older lady. She'd come out and she would offer me something to drink, you know. Or sometimes she'd give me $5. My father complained because according to him, $5 didn't even pay for the gas. Folks, this is back in the day when $5 could fill your gas tank. So it certainly paid for the gas to mow along. But they had, like we had, about an acre of land. So it was a pretty good sized yard and it took me a good while to mow it. But I believed as a child of God that we're called to be good neighbors. And being a good neighbor is not smiling at you and saying hello or waving when I see you pass by. Being a good neighbor is doing and being neighborly. And any time our neighbors needed something, whatever it might be, back in the day. See, we don't do this nowadays, but back in the day, neighbors would often come over and say, I'm sorry, but could I possibly borrow a couple of uh, cups of flour? Or could I borrow a few eggs? Or could I borrow uh, a stick of butter? See, back in the day, we used to do that. And we would always, you know, certainly, if we had it, it, it was as good as theirs. If they had it, it was as good as ours. I moved to Texas, and Tommy and I had our house there in East Dallas, and our neighbors were an older couple on one side, and I noticed one day that their lawn had gotten awful high, and I was out mowing my lawn, so I thought, well, I'll go ahead and mow their lawn. Maybe the old man is sick or something, and you know, and he's not able. I said, maybe you know, it'll help them feel good that at least the lawn's been mowed. So I mowed their lawn as well. Well, I got a tongue lashing for that. Neighbor lady chewed me up one side down the other because my husband enjoys doing our lawn and he takes care of our lawn. And blah, blah. I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, honestly, I was trying to help. I thought maybe he was sick or otherwise uh, indisposed and I was trying to be helpful, you know, because that's how I believe. Well, with that neighbor, I learned real quick that it was an exercise in futility to try to be neighborly to that lady. Her husband and I got along pretty well, but you, that lady was just not to be pleased. She reminded me a lot of my father. But there was another neighbor across the street from us in one house over, another older man, and his yard was constantly high with grass and just really messy and didn't look good. And I know he was old. I know he had health troubles. There had been at least one or two times that we had seen an ambulance out in front of their house. 
So I began to go every single time I'd mow my lawn, I would drive my little mower. I had to drive it to the corner so I could go down the little ramp, you know, at the corner, the handicap access, you know, and I'd go across the street and come back up the block and I'd mow his front lawn for him. And he was always grateful. He just sang my praises and told me how grateful he was. And he said to me at one point, he said, you know, he said, you really do live this Christian thing the way that it's supposed to be lived, and I'm grateful for that. That old fellow eventually died, and they sold his house. So while we were living there, he did indeed pass away. But you know... Being friendly and being neighborly are not the same thing. A lot of people put on the act just enough to get by. But they won't go out of their way for anybody. They're not going to go out of their way to help somebody. They're not going to go out of their way to do anything for anybody else. But you see, as a child of God, I understood that the Lord said, our love is not love until and unless, listen to me, it is demonstrated in our actions. See, we got a lot of Christians in the church today who love to preach a hateful, homophobic, nasty, bitter message at people with whom they disagree and then they'll say I only am saying this I'm only doing this because I love you well thank you if that's your love then hate me all you want to because I don't need your love love is not love until it is demonstrated in your actions and listen you may be fool enough to believe that an abusive husband who beats his wife is demonstrating his love for her I am not your abuse your criticism your negativity your nastiness honey uh-uh, that's not what love looks like. That's not how I saw Jesus demonstrating love. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. And I know, according to the camel in my Bible, according to the greater theme in my Bible, I know that we are called to be like Jesus. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Oh, children, listen to me. In Proverbs 21, verses 2 and 3, the word of the Lord today tells us. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. So while you swallow camels and gagged gnats, the truth of the matter is, it's that camel that God is looking for you to have nibbled on. It's that camel God is expecting you to have chewed upon and digested and allowed to become a part of you. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8, He that showed thee, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. 
I love the 15th Psalm today, which reads, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes, listen, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear of the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. What does that mean? That means when somebody makes a promise or a vow, that in order for them to keep, it's going to cost them. Or it's going to hurt them. I've talked about it before, how I promised that I was in a relationship and I promised the person I was with's mother that I would help her move. And when did she decide to move? But just two days after I got back from going to another state and picking up a bunch of my own stuff that was in storage, I was exhausted. I was wiped out. The person that I was with said, well, tell my mother you can't do it. I said, I can't do that. I already promised her weeks ago I would help her do this. I cannot do that. So no matter what it costs me, no matter what, how I am affected, I have to do what I said I would do. I tell you, you don't find a lot of people do that nowadays. No, they'll make a vow, they'll make a promise, and then they'll break it in a moment with some excuse. But the Word of God said in Psalm 15, He that honoreth, excuse me, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. The primary themes by which a believer is governed are love, grace, faith, and compassion. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensure it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The greater themes are the camels. And those things, if they're to benefit us, we must chew our food. Amen. Amen. We must digest it. We must allow it to nourish us and to become part of who we are. The Word of God declaring in John 3, 16 through 18, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world 
to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Condemnation is not part of the gospel. Condemnation is not part of our message. And folks, I got news for you today. Condemnation is not something that ought to be in the arsenal of any believer. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Working on our outward appearance so that we look good before men does absolutely nothing toward establishing our place in heaven. Our standing before God rests squarely upon our faith and our ability to believe and to maintain our belief in this great gospel. In Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't you see the emphasis God puts on what's going on in the heart? Oh, it's not about your actions. It's not about your words. Those things are important to the extent that man sees them. There is some value in understanding. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That is two very important statements, my friend. That means... Don't sit there and act like a fool and say, only God can judge me. I'm going to act like a Karen. I'm going to act like some kind of a raging maniac. And then I'm going to sit there and say, only God can judge me. No, no, no. We are called to be a light in a dark world. We're called to be a witness to the lost. We are called to be a city that is built upon a hill which cannot be hid. Therefore, we must understand that human beings can only see what they can see. And therefore, there is importance in living the life. There is importance in doing the best we can do. But then there are weightier matters. The weightier matters inform our doing what we can do. If we can get the love right, we're going to act better. If we can get the compassion right, then we're going to act better. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. If we can get the grace right, we can act better. If we can get our faith right, we'll act better. But we've got to take care of the weightier matters and not leave the other undone. Hallelujah. My Lord, listen to me. Interestingly enough today, the gnats upon which most Christians choke are generally those issues which they extrapolate from the Word of God. 
which they believe apply to others. Never themselves. No, the things that most Christians choke on, the issues they get most hung up on, are issues that they claim have no relation to themselves at all. I'm not gay, but boy howdy am I a gay, anti-gay activist. I've never had an abortion, or I'm a man, I'll never get an abortion. But boy am I an anti-abortion activist. They gag on these nets because, because these issues are issues that affect other people. And oh, how easily we get choked up on issues that affect other people and have no bearing on us ourselves. Mm -hmm. You seldom see a hypocrite struggling with a finer point in the Bible that directly affects them. But you will see a hypocrite arguing and debating such issues with others. Oh my Lord, as they struggle to fix everyone else around them. Hmm. The gnats always choke us and give us trouble as they relate to others. But the camels go down easily as they relate to ourselves. We don't even take time to try to understand. We don't even take time to try to digest them. Oh my Lord, listen to me now. The only time a gnat becomes a watermelon within our esophagus is when we see them as applying to everyone else. Lastly, today in Romans 14, 16 through 23, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. I might substitute, instead of meat and drink, we might substitute the words rules and regulations for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink it's not rules and regulations but righteousness meaning doing right acting right and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost <coughs> for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God. Now listen to these next four words. And approved of men. If you do this thing right, folks, people aren't going to look at you as a rabble rouser. They're not going to look at you as a troublemaker. They're not going to look at you as hateful and cruel and homophobic and bitter and nasty and full of angst. No. If you do this thing right, even those outside of the faith will look at you with admiration and appreciation. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Verse 19, Romans 14, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. For the sake of rules, do not destroy the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Here he said, all things are indeed pure, but it is evil for the man. In other words, if you feel you shouldn't do this or do that, then for you it's evil. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. But don't you try to push that on someone else. 
Eiter. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is what I tell LGBT believers all the time. If you stand convinced by the Word of God that you have standing by faith in Jesus Christ before the God of heaven, then don't you let someone else's thoughts, someone else's feelings, someone else's beliefs affect your stance mm -hmm. because what they believe in this matter will mean nothing before God all that matters to God is where were you at what did you believe what did you understand am I telling the Amen. truth today oh children I want to tell you it's easy today to overlook the weightier matters and to get choked up by the small issues, the lesser issues. But this afternoon, I've got a word for you from God, and that word is this. Chew your food. Amen. <laughs> there are some big issues. They're not easy to tackle. Love is not an easy thing to conquer. I'm telling you, justice is not an easy thing to conquer. Compassion and faith are not always the easiest issues to contend with. But in the end, they are the most rewarding. In the end, they are the most nourishing. And in the end, they are the weightier matters that mean more to the Lord because they affect what's going on inside rather than trying to change what's happening outside. And as we affect what is going on within us, our conduct will change. Our conduct will develop. Our conduct will grow. We'll be better externally after we have worked toward being better internally. And the only way to be better internally is to chew your food. Hallelujah. Amen.